we have been talking about who we want to be, what we highly value as a church. I remind you that these aren't something that the pastor sat down at his desk and made up. These came out of leadership conferences where people from every ministry, every Sunday school class, elders, deacons, past, present, gathered together with the staff and just prayerfully throughout time asked God, who are we, where we're going, how do we get there? Three real simple things, it seems like, but they're very complex. When we look at who are we, we decided there's some things that just really mark us as a church, and they're things that have been in the works for 172 years. We celebrate our 172nd year this year. Isn't that amazing? I'm proud of you founding members who are here. You guys have done a great job. Great job. There are things that, that have come through, there are things that come through different people in this church, certainly different leaders of this church. Brother Joe's DNA flows through this church to this day. And, and there, there are things, though, that really have been given to us by God, and we've been talking about that. Last week, Daniel brought up that we said we want to love without limits. That is not an easy thing to do, but it is an important thing and a required thing. As a matter of fact, Paul writes a letter to the Romans. We've been studying that for months in the 316 class. It is an incredible book. And Paul has never been to Rome, so because of that, he can't assume any kind of common knowledge, and so he is very clear. Judy's teaching a class on theology. I encourage all of you at some point in time to take that. It's what, like 52 weeks? And, and then it starts over again, so you can jump in or jump out at any point. But basic understandings of doctrine and theology. We draw heavily from the book of Romans because Paul has to be so clear and precise because he's never met these people. And he, Paul, has this important image in mind. He says, this church in Rome, this church at the very center of the world, this church where people come and go from all over the world, this church is key. Here's that ball back, by the way. Thank you for giving that to me. There you go. <laughs> this church is key to spreading the gospel throughout the world. And because of that, he wants to be absolutely sure that they understand the gospel. That the understanding of the gospel and what Christ has done is absolutely clear. And so he goes back very to the beginning. He talks about all men being darkened in sin. He talks about how the entire universe groans for redemption. And then he talks about how Christ came, died on the cross, and satisfies God's wrath against our sins. How he is the atonement for our sins. And he goes through this point by point, step by step, like a lawyer laying out his case. It's beautiful to read. And it is certainly edifying. But all of a sudden, in this book, he takes a really weird turn. And you have to say, whoa, what happened? We were in all this deep theology, and all of a sudden, it just becomes this absolutely practical. And long about 11 and 12 chapters, he starts to turn it. And here's why. Paul knows that if a church has absolutely the right theology but they don't love one another, the gospel will never go forward. Now you should say a loud amen to that. Because that is a bedrock truth. Now number one, let me tell you, we need to know the word of God. We need to hold fast to the word of God. We don't need to pervert it or change it or anything like that. We need to know it and hold on to it. We need to rightly divide the word of truth as Paul tells Timothy. Amen? But we can hold on to it like that and not have love, and it won't go anywhere. As a matter of fact, to quote a famous theologian preacher, we'll be like sounding, clashing cymbals, amen, if we don't have love. And so Paul takes this theological treatise, and he begins to, he begins to talk about what they are going to have to do in order to be a church that God can use. Again, we've had this discussion as a church, and so we read today Romans 12, verse 9 and 10. Let love be without hypocrisy. Everybody say hypocrisy. Now, if you don't know that word, just go ask a heathen, and they'll tell you what it is. 
because they say that we're all guilty of it. Hypocrisy comes from the Greek plays, maybe you've heard this before, and, and they would put on a mask, and when they put on the mask, they became that character, but underneath, they're still an actor. And so they're saying, he's saying, don't let love be in a mask. Don't let it be fake. How do you not make love fake? How, how is love genuine? And by the way, people can sniff out fakes a mile away. And Paul's saying, don't be fake in your love. And he goes on and says, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, verse 10 is our key today. I want you to really pay attention to this one. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Friends, church ought to be more than socializing. It's a great place to get caught up. Unfortunately, it's a great place to talk about the latest football game. It's a great place to talk about how your golf score is doing, about family news, about health concerns, to visit and catch up with friends, to get a cup of coffee together, a warm handshake, a friendly pat on the back. They're all part of this beautiful social interaction that we need as human beings. I love, I, I, it's hard for me to refrain from a nice little sideways hug. High fives, fist bumps. That's just part of what I think it means to be human. But the Bible tells us that all of this is good, but the New Testament fellowship must go, must go much deeper than this. Much deeper than merely socializing when we get together at church. You see, New Testament fellowship... This love that Paul's talking about takes place when we consider how we can lift up, how we can build up, how we can brighten up our brothers and sisters in Christ. When we come, that ought to be forefront on our minds. I tell you what, you learn this in Kentucky. As a matter of fact, at the University of Kentucky, they have a whole class on how to give preference to one another and make them feel good about themselves. Happens every Saturday at football games. Look at Steve, proudly wearing his orange today. I mean, it's no longer a color of shame after yesterday. Christian fellowship takes place when we offer encouragement to our friends, when we pray for them, when we confess our sins and our weaknesses to one another. These are elements that make fellowship genuine. And I'm going to tell you something. We talked about it last week. We all want to be where everybody knows our name, and they're always glad we came and if you want to have love without limits, you must, have to, you must learn to have this Christian fellowship that offers encouragement, prayer. And I ask you a question, how are you at this? And we as leaders as a church always ought to ask ourselves, how about us as a church? Are we merely socializing or are we practicing Christian fellowship? It's absolutely important to evaluate your life and the life of this church, the life of your family. Do we really love without hypocrisy? And so, he gives us a way to measure it. How can we know that we're not faking it? And he says it right away. He says, give preference. Would you say that with me? Give preference. The first thing I want you to see today is that in loving one another, we are to give preference to one another. As a matter of fact, again, that's what we said, that we... Place, we place people over preference. In other words, we offer them preference. And so this word, proegiomai, means to lead the way. It literally means to lead the way before and to show deference to the other person. And it's the only time, this is the only time this word is used in all of Scripture. And if you understand the Greek, this is in the middle voice, which indicates that the subject initiates the action. That we are to be the first ones to give preference to the other people. That we're the ones, when we're traveling down the road, who will see that person trying to get into the lane and we'll pause and let them in. Even if we saw them yesterday not let us in. And so it's saying here, listen to this very carefully. When you love somebody, you take the lead, you lead the way, and you show them deference. You make their preferences more important than yours. You never wait for them to do it to you. You take the lead, and you put them first. Everybody understand that? 
it's very important that we get this idea that we initiate giving the preference to other people. Now, this is not easy. The verb, again, means that we continually do this, that it happens over and over. So it's in the present tense. This is to be our habitual practice. Our lifestyles before a critically watching world are to love one another, to give deference to one another, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, not relying on our own adequacy, but His adequacy, and showing that the other people in our lives are more important than ourselves. Now, how many of you know that's easy to do? Boy, I I see all those hands. It's not easy to do, is it? In sin, we naturally desire to put ourselves first. What's one of the first words a child learns after mama and papa? Say it, mine, mine, mine. Kaufman says, This carries the connotation of setting an example, of taking the lead in honoring others. Instead of coveting and trying to grasp honor for oneself, the Christian should rather desire to exalt his fellow Christians, even taking the lead in the conveyance of such honors to them. So again, those who follow Christ are to continually, supernaturally give preference to one another. It's something that does not come natural. Barclay talks about this. Listen to what he says. More than half of the trouble that arises in churches concerns rights and privileges and places and prestige. Someone has not been given his or her place. Someone has been neglected or unthanked. Someone has been given a more prominent place on a platform than someone else, and there is trouble. It is not easy to give each other priority and honor. There is enough of the natural man in most of us to like to get our rights. How true It is. I've told you the story before, but I'll remind you of it. New pastor goes to a church, and he declares that he likes, I guess it was potato salad or something like that. And so, obviously, there's half a dozen potato salads show up at the church potluck. And he's eating a potato salad, and he just brags on it and brags on it to everybody, and it causes the church split because he picked the wrong potato salad. But Sister Susie's potato salad was known to be the best. And the pastor ignored her and split the church right down the middle. We we give preference. We take the lead in allowing other people to be first. Again, that's not easy. And so we understand today if we are walking in the truth, of the first part of this verse, walking in the Spirit, as he talked about earlier, we're truly devoted to one another in brotherly love, then it will be supernaturally easy to give preference to one another. And here we're not talking about something that we haven't seen before. What we're talking about is Christ's example of humility, not thinking more highly of ourselves than we ought to think in Romans 12, 3. It is doing nothing that is not relying on ourself, It is doing nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of minds regarding one another more important than ourselves. Again, we're not merely looking out for our own selves or the interests of our own families or the interests of our own Sunday school class or the interests of our own ministry. We're looking out for the good of others. So to honor the other person is one way of holding in check the innate human tendency to honor ourselves unduly. If we're focusing on others, it's somewhat more difficult to focus on ourselves. Isn't that what Christ did? Though being equal with God, not thinking of robbery to be considered equal with God, humbled himself even to the point of dying on a cross. And that's what we're to do. We're to put others first, give preference. And so I was just down with the Promised Land staff, and I shared with them that as a church we said, One of the most important things that we do is that children's ministry, amen? I mean, in our minds, in the minds of the leaders of this church, that is absolutely important. And so the challenger class or the go-getters ought to say, boy, that children's ministry is one of the most important things that we do. But the children's ministry should never say that about themselves. 
The children's ministry should look at the go-getters and say, the go-getters, that's one of the most important things we do. But the go-getters should never think that about themselves. Do you guys see how this works? We give preference one to another. We elevate the others. We don't have to elevate ourselves. Boy, if we could just get this. If we could just get this, the church would just come alive and people would be crying out to come. Instead, the world sees hypocrisy. People who say they love the way Christ loved, the people who say God so loved the world that we ought to love one another, and they see it not happening, and they don't want to be a part of it. Again, Paul's saying you need to have the right doctrine, but you need to love one another without hypocrisy, and that happens when you put other people first. I knew my wife loved me. Boy, I tell you what, growing up in... Parkersburg, West Virginia, there wasn't a Mexican restaurant in town. So for my 18th birthday, I wanted to go to Columbus, Ohio, and we ate at a Mexican restaurant in the Eastland Mall. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. 18 years old. Golly, that was a long time ago. That's when they were just inventing Mexicans. I'm sorry. And... And finally, they get a Mexican restaurant in Parkersburg, and I eat there all the time. And as a matter of fact, we live so close to it that we could smell it. <laughs> it was like the second coming of Christ. It was awesome. Well, I moved to Glasgow, Kentucky, and there was nothing there but a Taco Bell. And Taco Bell's okay, but it's just not quite the same. And one day, one day, oh my goodness. There was a Kentucky Fried Chicken within sight of the church there. And one day, God transformed. It, 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 was, it, was, it was amazing. It was like the Mount of Transfiguration. And the KFC was now El Mazatlan. I don't know what El Mazatlan means, but it sounds good to me. I walked out the back door of the church and I smelled fajitas from heaven. I am absolutely convinced that manna was fajitas. That was awesome. And so we would go there. It was a hole in the wall. It was, now it's really grown up because I paid for the new building myself. One Sunday, but Angela Mills didn't grow up with Mexican food and she didn't really like it. And we married each other anyway. One Sunday after church, I said, honey, where would you like to go for dinner? And she said, let's go to the Mexican restaurant. I about had a wreck. And I'll never forget it. I looked over and I said, you love me. You love me. I'm going to tell you, men, when your wife says, let's go to the Mexican restaurant, it makes you want to give preference to her. You know what? Now I go to those women restaurants. You know, the ones where you have to check your man card? The men where the, the places where they put powdered sugar on everything. They take a perfectly good ham sandwich and they put apple butter on it. You know what I'm talking about? You walk in, you see another guy, you go, yeah, I understand. I know where you know, come out. That's how we're to love one another, amen? You know why I felt God called us to come to this church? When I walked in that 110-year-old sanctuary and I saw drums on the stage and I saw youthy stuff all over the place and I knew everybody that had grown up there that had precious memories there had said we're going to put our youth before our preferences that's not easy to do is it but you did it and I believe that's why God's blessing this church there's a second thing we see here give preference to one another everybody say one another this means each other and speaks of a mutuality, a sharing of sentiments between two persons or groups of persons. It's a reciprocal pronoun. It means back and forth. Things that we have in common. Things that unite us and draw us together. This is God's description and prescription for a body of believers. That it is for us to live life together. I love being here eating chili with people and going to trunks and seeing the kids and having fun. Don't you? I'm going to tell you something today. Get this in your mind. The Christian life is not me and Jesus got our own thing going. 
The Christian life is living it together with people who are united in the bond of Christ, who have been saved through his blood and power, and who, who live filled with his Holy Spirit. That is awesome. We are to live life together. It's a common New Testament phrase. It happens over and over, and most uses relate to the building up of the body of Christ. There are dozens of one another. Encourage one another, strengthen one another, pray for one another, lift up one another, correct one another, pray for one another. It goes over and over and over again. Listen, I want you to understand this today. Get this, really get this. Jesus Christ is not coming back for a bunch of glorified individuals. He's coming back for his corporate bride, the church. And he sees us as individuals, and he sees the hair on our head or where it went. But more importantly, he's waiting for the bride to be prepared. And you know what? The bride is prepared when we're working on one another and loving one another. Amen? And so the idea is here that we love the people who we are united with in Christ, not just me and Jesus, that we are to place the people who are in relationship with Christ above ourselves, above ourselves. Third thing I want you to see here is this word honor. Honor. This word honor refers to worth, value, to merit, it is the idea of understanding how God would value somebody. Now, let me just ask you a question today. How do you think God values that person next to you? How do you think? How do you think God values these Baptist guys right here that are with us today? Even Daniel. I'm going to tell you how much God values that child in Africa, that person down under the bridge. He values them so much that he sent, as Daniel said earlier, his only son, that whoever, whoever would believe in him would not perish. That's how much God values that person next, sitting next to you in the pew. Gary Smalley describes it like this. He says, when you walk into a room and you see somebody... He says, when you value them, when you honor them, it's like saying, oh, man, it's Frank. Frank. <gasps> Frank, it's so good to see you. Diane, make sure you do that. How many of you love Frank and know that Frank is worthy of honor? <laughs> You're going to run out of fingers and toes, brother. Jim, <laughs> go big orange, I still love you. <laughs> that is not what we're supposed to do. <laughs> to show value, to value other people the way God values them. To say you're more important than at least from my perspective, to say that ministry is so important, we're going to give deference to them. We're not fighting for our piece of the turf. We're not fighting for our place. We're not fighting to get honor. We're doing everything we can to give it to somebody else. A few years ago, pulled Evelyn Brown to the side. I said, Evelyn, I know there's money in place for a kitchen to expand the current kitchen that we have, but I think we're going to outgrow that fellowship hall right away. And, and I've just got a thought here, and a couple other folks have had the same thought. What if we let the children have that fellowship hall and we build a new kitchen in the other building? And here's a lady that loves the kitchen. Here's a lady that's been going to church here for years who had spent hundreds of hours in that kitchen. And she said, I think that's a great idea. 
And for almost two years, she and the incredible fellowship ministry carted food back and forth across the courtyard to serve us. And it was always with a smile. And you know what they were doing? They were giving preference to others, showing honor. They were loving without hypocrisy. Today, we got a beautiful facility for the children's ministry. And whenever we have the ladies' extravaganza, or we have the trunk or treat, or we have the breakfast with Santa, the kitchen's right there in a room fit for what needs to be used. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit's flowing through those people who are willing to say, that's important. And I'll take a subservient place. I'm glad to be a part of that kind of church. Are you? And I encourage you and I challenge you to just pause right now. And I want you to think about your own life. At home, do you demand your way? Does the remote control stay in your hands? Do you only eat at your favorite restaurant? You know, one of the worst things a couple can do that leads to divorce is to build a house together because everybody wants their own thing. Is that you? Or could you guys go out today and build a house together and still be married? Let me ask you about your workplace. Are you willing to let somebody else get the glory? Are you willing to do that? That's hard, isn't it? Isn't it hard to really work hard and somebody else gets on your coattails? Are you willing to do that? I'm not saying be abused or mistreated, but I'm saying willing to let other people receive honor. And what about, what about here at church? Are you willing to say that my preferences are not near as important as others? In this core value, it goes on to say that the most important people in this church are the ones who are not here yet. Do you believe that today? Our culture speaks a different language. If you don't like the song that Daniel and the band played when you came in this morning, it's okay. It doesn't have to be your favorite. But if you're willing to give preference to somebody else who just really might like that, I mean, the choir was into it, crazy people swaying back and forth. If you're willing to do that, the world will see your love, and they'll want to be a part. Because in your love they see Christ. Are you willing to do that? Piano's going to play. Right where you are, I'm just going to take five minutes. I want you to just say, God, help me to give you first place in my life. And help me to give others second place. Help me to lay aside my preferences and show honor to others. Help me to love the way Christ loved without hypocrisy. If you need this altar today for any reason, if there's a burden, you can lay that down. If you need prayer, somebody will come and pray for you. If you have a worry, a doubt, a fear, this is a good time to just get rid of that. If you'd like to join this church, partner with us in these core values and the ministry God's called us to, we would love to receive you. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and been baptized or are willing to be baptized in testimony to that, we invite you to come. As the piano plays, would you pray?